Hi Trinity, it's Kristen Walker again, Director of Outreach. Today, I'm going to share two more ways that you can help in Birmingham right now, as well as provide an update on our Benevolence Outreach Program. The first way that you can help in Birmingham right now is to donate to our hygiene supply drive, which will benefit those who are incarcerated in Alabama. Specific items that are needed right now are travel size shampoos, conditioners, bar soap, hand sanitizer, and tissues. We will have a donation drop-off bin in the Trinity Oxmoor Fellowship Hall for an ongoing um, basis. So you can come by during the work week and drop items off at any time. The second way that you can help people right now is by donating children's clothing to our children's clothing closet. Our children's clothing closet is located at the Trinity West Homewood campus and benefits those in our community who are unable to afford clothing for their kids. We do not have a lot of space for toys or very large items. So we prioritize clothing that is in season, that is clean, not torn or monogrammed, like new high chairs, strollers, pack and place. We will accept these donations at the Trinity West Homewood campus on Tuesdays from noon to 1 p.m. If you have any questions about clothing closet donations, please reach out to me at the email listed here. Also, as an update, for those of you who are unaware, Trinity's Benevolence Ministry, which usually provides utility assistance, but at this time has expanded to provide utility and rent assistance to those who are in need, um, is continuing because of the generosity of many, many of our uh, church family members, as well as a very generous grant from the Community Foundation of Greater Birmingham. We are so grateful to be able to continue to support our neighbors in this practical way right now. We hope that you all stay well and stay tuned for more videos in the coming weeks. Bye. Good morning, church, and welcome to worship here at Trinity United Methodist in Birmingham, Alabama. My name is Brian Erickson. I'm the senior pastor here, and we are so grateful to have you worshiping with us this morning. Our radio broadcast on 1070 AM and 99.5 FM uh, here in the Birmingham area is sponsored by Ann and Ken Damsgaard this morning in loving memory and in honor of all our mothers, and we give thanks to Ken and Ann for sponsoring that important ministry and what an appropriate sponsorship for this Mother's Day. I'm also grateful for these beautiful altar flowers that are in loving memory of Jane Maxwell from the Fly and Bell families, and we give thanks to those families for supporting that important ministry as well. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations over these last few days with you church members, but also other pastors here in Birmingham and across the country about when we might be able to get back together for in-person worship as uh, businesses start to reopen. I want to let you know that I think that date is probably a ways down the road, much further than any of us would like to admit, but we are paying attention uh, to all the indicators and all the data to make sure that when we do come back, we will come back as soon as we can where we can ensure the safety of all of our brothers and sisters sisters in Christ. Your safety is of our utmost concern, and I know that this online worship is not uh, the best of circumstances, but I'm so grateful for the technology that keeps us bound together, allows us to worship God even if we are distant from one another. Uh, finally, I want to say on this Mother's Day, I'm mindful that many of you are not able to be with your mothers. Maybe you've lost your mom uh, this year. Some of you who are mothers are not able to be with your children or your grandchildren because of social distancing. And I think one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that I'm especially mindful of as we worship together online is that even when we are not in the same geographical place, we can be united together spiritually through the work of God. And so even those who have gone before us that we see no longer, even those that we wish that we could be side by side with breaking bread together at a Sunday dinner table this afternoon, even when we aren't physically with those folks, we can be bound together with them through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's my prayer for all of us uh, on this Mother's Day. Let us prepare our hearts to meet God in this unusual way, bound together by the promise of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of Christ's love and mercy. 
Let us worship God together. Soldiers watched in vain 
was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the Church, as we come together to pray, we extend our sympathy and prayers to Jennifer and Keith Andrus and family on the death of his grandmother, Dixie Barnett, on April 25th, and to Gwen and Jim Williams and family on the death of his sister, Mary Brinkley, on April 30th, and to Tara and Clay Williams and family on the death of her grandmother, Ruth Bush, on May 1st. And today we celebrate the gift of new life. Daniel Diaz, who was born on April 27th, son of Cameron and Dale Diaz, the flower on the flower stand is in his honor. Now let us go to God in prayer. God of light, nothing evades your sight. You know who we are. From our coming into the world and into our twilight. You know the places where we are willing to serve and the places where we find ourselves solely centered on ourselves. Help us, God, in all seasons of our life to faithfully name these roadblocks, these places of ease, and those places of faithlessness and faithfulness. Let us not settle for small growths, but to fully take hold of how you would call us to be authentic in the calling you consistently lay out in our lives. God, in the midst of this most unusual season, allow us to see your light transforming and moving in ways never imagined. Let us see opportunities to be better neighbors, to connect with family in more meaningful ways, and to share in acts of generosity. Holy God, when it can feel as if it is all too much, when we feel as if we are trapped in darkness, remind us of the opportunity to take a good look at where we are and who we are and who you have called us to be in this world. As we traverse this difficult path, guide us with grace and mercy to set aside our bindings, whatever they may be, and seek you with the utmost reverence. Allow us, especially on this Mother's Day, to give witness to all those who have set that path before us, who have carried us before and still carry us today, who nurture, provide, love, and sacrificially give every day for us with no return expected. We thank you, God, for all the mothers in our lives, those who from birth have cared for us and those who have ensured that the warmth of a mother's hug would not be lost on us. And God, especially for those who on this Mother's Day, it brings new meaning either through the joy of new life, the ending of an earthly chapter, or the relentless battle of infertility. 
God, we ask that your presence and grace be ever close. Guide us in how best we can serve in our presence, our prayers, our gifts, and our witness. That these recognitions may not be ends of themselves, but lead us to grasp more each day what it means to be a follower and not an onlooker. Let these paths of devotion be a means to further grow and not devotions that end with this season's turn. Holy God, we praise you for your steadfastness in our lives. As we join together in the words of the prayer your son first taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Earlier this week, we had the privilege of baptizing Jude Ellis, who is the son of Laura and Russell Ellis, uh, the little brother to Farah. And Part of baptism is recognizing three promises that are made. Chiefly among them is the promise that God makes to each of us, that it's not about who we are or what we've done, it's about who God is and what God has done for us, even if we are an infant or a child. The second promise is, of course, the promise of parents or guardians to nurture that life, to nurture that child in the Christian faith and raise them that one day with their own voice they will openly profess their faith in Jesus Christ. But the third and one of the most important promises is the promise that the church family makes to each of those lives. And we didn't want you to miss the chance to make your promise to Jude. So here's a moment where we'll share together in Jude's baptism and offer you the chance to profess your support of Jude and his growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We're grateful this morning to be able to share together in the baptism of Jude Alexander Ellis, who is the son of Russell and Laura Ellis and little brother to Farah Ellis. And we're mindful on this Mother's Day weekend especially of the nature of Christian family, that sometimes water is thicker than blood. As we are invited into the body of Christ by dying and being risen with Christ through the waters of baptism, we are reminded in this sacrament that sometimes God shows up in simple ways. Sometimes God shows up by reminding us that we are connected to people that we can no longer see, and oftentimes the connections of faith are as important as the connections of family. And I'm so grateful uh, that the Ellis family has brought Jude forward in these unusual days uh, to remember the promise of baptism. And so I ask you to both in the presence of God and our assembled congregation who are watching you, um, do you confess your sin? If so say, we do. We do. Do you put your whole trust and faith in Jesus Christ and promise to serve him in union with your Savior as well as in union with his church? If so say, we do. We do. And this is the most important question. As the two parents to whom God has entrusted Jude's life, do you do all in your power to so raise him in a Christian household by your own teaching and example, one day with his own voice he will openly profess his faith in Jesus. If so, say we will. We will. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, uh, bless this water and he who receives it, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in Christ's eternal victory. Amen. What name is given this child? Jude Alexander Ellis. Jude Alexander. You're not going to like this, Jude, but I believe you. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Farrah, can you help me pray for Jude? Can you put your hand on Jude? We're going to pray for you? Okay, just think about it. Gracious and holy God, Lord, I thank you so much for the gift of Jude Alexander. I thank you for his parents. I thank you for his big sister. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of his life and all that you have in store for him. God, we ask that you watch over him every day of his journey, that he might grow in his knowledge and trust of you, that he might know your grace and your mercy for himself, and he might hear your still small voice above all the other voices claiming to tell him who he is. God, we thank you for who he is in you. And we pray these things in the mighty and matchless name 
of your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Members of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care this day Jude Alexander, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that Jude Alexander may grow in the knowledge and love of God the Father through our Savior, Jesus Christ. With God's, God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Jude Alexander, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. It's been so encouraging to see the many signs of God's kingdom at work in our community, even and especially during these days of pandemic. Just this week, we shared in the largest blood drive in our community since the outbreak of COVID-19 took place right here in our gym. And uh, so, so many people to thank uh, who were volunteering, but also who showed up uh, to give blood this past week. You've also been a part of feeding our homeless neighbors, feeding the children in our school systems who are food insecure, and making sure that everyone on the margins who is most threatened by the economic implications of this pandemic are taken care of, because that's what the people of God do. Your support, your financial gifts towards Trinity make all of that possible, and I can't thank you enough for the ways you have continued to be faithful to the outreach and to the ongoing mission of Christ Church. Let us prepare our hearts to meet God as we share in our gifts through our offertory.
A reading from the first letter to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as if first importance, which I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to uh, Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, boys and girls, we want you to come in close to the screen so you can listen to Miss Eleanor. And today she's going to talk about creepy crawly things, so you definitely don't want to miss this. Hey friends, I'm so glad that you're here with us today, and I hope you had a great first week of May. Whenever the calendar turns over to May, I start to get really excited, because in our house, that means it's time to wake up our garden for summer. And I brought with me something that we use in my house. We put this on our countertop in our kitchen, and it actually helps our garden grow with the help of some very important garden critters. So, In our house, after we finish a delicious banana, we'll take the peel and we'll drop it right inside this little canister. Or if we ate broccoli for dinner and nobody wants to eat that big, chunky stalk of the broccoli, then we put that in there. Or if the lettuce gets a little wilty in our refrigerator, which sometimes happens in our house, we'll put that lettuce in there too. And eventually, we'll take this little canister and we'll take it all the way out to our compost bin in our backyard. And so all we do is empty it out in there, and then every once in a while we put some grass clippings in there, and we use a shovel and turn it over now and again. And I bet you're wondering, Miss Eleanor, does that mean you have like a weird garbage pile in your backyard with apple cores and Brussels sprouts just hanging out in the back? Which is a good question. We don't because of one garden superhero, the earthworm, those creepy crawly critters have this special gift of taking something that is dead or discarded or that we call garbage and put in our compost bin and changing it into something new. It changes it into something like dirt. And you can talk to your families all about the biology lesson about how that worm changes old food into dirt another time. But that dirt is so cool because it is rich and things love to grow in it. It's really lovely and dark. And it's awesome. So you take that dirt and you put it out over your new garden, getting it ready for summer. And that helps things grow in your garden. So in a very real way, that earthworm takes something that we said was done, that we were done with, and changes it into something new, changes it and gives it new life. So our Bible passage today reminds us that God acts like that too. So God can take something that is dead and give it new life. And God can take our sadnesses and give us hope again. And God can take garbage and give something new purpose. Nothing is ever finished with God. And that is such good news for you and me because God can do that in our lives too. So I want you to go out into your backyard this week, and I want you to look for other examples of how God takes something that looks like we're done with it, or that's garbage, or it's dead. How does God change it and give it new life again, maybe with the help of a superhero like our earthworms? Let's pray together. Master Recycler, we are so grateful that nothing is wasted with you, O God. No potential no talent, no experience. You can use all of them. Thank you for reminding us that you are always working in us to make us a new creation every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
what you believe matters. Now, it goes without saying, what you think matters, what you know certainly matters. And I know you're all really smart people or you wouldn't be worshiping with us this morning. But at the heart of our faith is the idea that what you believe matters. Because what you believe on the inside will inevitably be reflected in the way you live on the outside. But even more than that, it will shape the world around you. And we have more power than we often admit to shape our own beliefs and to be shaped by them. What you believe changes how you see the world. It changes how you understand the ups and the downs of this life. It changes how you react when the world shuts down due to a virus. I just pulled that one out of a hat. When what you believe matters. One of the most important chapters in all of the New Testament is the 15th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church. And it's all about belief and why it matters so much. If you don't remember, the Corinthians have gotten confused about all sorts of important stuff. There is a long laundry list of things they've gotten wrong. And Paul spends this entire letter addressing those grievances. It's, it's their quarreling. They've got some Judge Judy kind of family situations going on. There's a little bit of everything happening inside the Corinthian church. Most of the letter is devoted to all the bad choices they've made incorrect behaviors that Paul has to set right, but he saved his most important argument for very last. Because even more than how they've strayed from the behaviors that Paul modeled for them, the thing that he is most concerned about is how they have watered down the gospel he preached to them, specifically as it relates to the resurrection. The resurrection for Paul is the non-negotiable. It is the, the one thing, the cornerstone, the foundation of everything else about the Christian faith. And what you believe about the resurrection matters most of all. So by chapter 15, Paul's addressed every other issue going on with that church, but he saved this most important thing for the end of the letter because this is the critical thing. This is the non-negotiable thing, that, that Jesus was really crucified that his crucified body was raised from the dead by God and that the same thing will happen for us. In our Encounter sermon series, we've been talking about these appearances of Jesus during the Easter season. What Scripture describes as these 40 days where Jesus shows up after the resurrection to his disciples. Not just to prove to them that he was raised, but because the work of Easter is not finished on that first Easter Sunday morning. Jesus shows up in unexpected places both then and now. And here in 1 Corinthians, Paul captures what is likely the oldest witness to the resurrection in the entire New Testament. Before the Gospels were written, but before the books of the New Testament were finalized, Paul begins by reminding them what he first proclaimed among them. That the good news that I preach to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you are being saved. I love the way that Paul describes the faith, not as something we possess, not, not as a set of ideas that we hold on to, but something much bigger than any one of us. Something that we step into, something that takes hold of us. It's not a a set of, of propositions. It's not something we can control. It's something that happens to us, something that happens in us, something that we find ourselves handed over to. It's even bigger than Paul. He names for them that these beliefs, this tradition was passed on to him, that that he then handed it over to the Corinthians. In other words, this isn't something he came up with. It's not some clever idea he thought up and then preached to them. This is something that happened, that people saw and experienced firsthand, and they talked about and preached about and passed on. And not just that, but Paul says it is of first importance. Meaning that nothing else is more important. Nothing else replaces this as the core of the Christian faith, the core of our Christian hope, that Christ was crucified for our sins, that he really died, that he was buried. On the third day he rose again, and the same thing waits for those who die and live again in Christ. Most scholars believe that these verses towards the beginning of chapter 15 are part of an ancient Christian creed. 
A, a simple way in the days right after Jesus' resurrection to share and teach the faith that believers would have passed on to one another because what you believe matters. That Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And again, what Paul wants to make sure the Corinthians understand, what he wants to make sure we understand, is that because Jesus was raised, we will be raised also. Not just in spirit, not just our souls, but our bodies will be raised. Think for just a moment about that first Easter Sunday, that message we proclaim so often when we get dressed up in our pastels and we put flowers on the cross. If the women go to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning and they find the body there, but they're told, don't worry, the soul of Jesus has gone to heaven, that's not Easter, right? It's not the same at all. Paul wants the Corinthians to understand when we lose sight of the radical nature of what's happened when Jesus is raised from the dead and what it means for each of us in Christ. We've not only missed the core of the Christian faith, we've lost any solid basis we we had for having genuine hope in this life. Because what you believe matters. Christ was the first to be raised, the firstborn of the resurrection, but certainly not the last. Every week when we profess together in worship during what's called the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the resurrection of the dead, that's what we're talking about, the resurrection of the body. It comes from this very chapter from Paul's own words. In fact, in Greek, the language that Paul is writing this letter in, the the literal phrase here is the resurrection of the corpses, which sounds more like something you would say at Halloween, not during Easter. Imagine for those of you who aren't already super comfortable with the Christian faith, that you were to show up to a worship service, to show up to a church, and within the first five minutes of the service beginning, they're talking about corpses, because that's what we're doing here. The Corinthians believe in the afterlife. They believe in some form of heaven. They even believe maybe that Jesus was resurrected bodily. They're just not a fan of this idea that other bodies will be raised. It's too crass. It's too crude. It's too much of a stretch. You see, the Corinthians like the idea of resurrection. They like the idea of life after death. They love the metaphor that hope springs eternal, that there is something beyond this life. They just don't like the idea of dead bodies being raised. That's a little too far. We had a wonderful couple in this church who I will call Jim and Sarah. Jim and Sarah were members of this church for decades, and they served in all sorts of ways. They left an indelible mark on the history of our church family. But they were also both brilliant scientists and students of history, two of the most creative and vibrant minds I have ever met, and that left them both a little Corinthian in their thinking. I I went to visit them not long after I came to Trinity as a pastor, and Sarah confessed to me that she and Jim had spent the last 70 or so years saying everything in the Apostles' Creed except for the part about the resurrection of the dead. Every week when that part of worship came around, they stood, they said the rest of the creed, but they did not affirm the resurrection of the corpses. They were scientists. They had seen corpses. They don't get up after they die. It was just a little too much, a little too out of sorts to imagine the dead getting up again and being alive. To be honest, I sort of loved them more for their honesty, that they cared enough about what they were saying not to utter words they couldn't stand behind. And when Jim passed away at the family's request, we didn't say the Apostles' Creed at his funeral. You can see why the Corinthians were a little iffy on that one point, that they are not the only ones. But for Paul, you cannot really claim the Christian faith if you reject the most disarming and troubling and hopeful portions of it. You can't pick and choose the essentials, Paul declares. Now, now for those of you that are professional doubters, hear me out. I stand with you. I like logic. I like science. I've never been one who can simply flip the switch of belief in my mind and just suddenly trust in something. 
Maybe you are one of those folks who really appreciate parts of the Christian message. You're even curious about the Christian faith. You like the Sermon on the Mount, the message about forgiveness. You love Jesus' emphasis on justice for the poor, turning your cheek. You like the metaphor of resurrection because it's beautiful. The idea that every cocoon dies and becomes a beautiful butterfly. Maybe you even believe in the afterlife that the soul lives on even if the body dies. It strikes me that many of us in the modern church would resonate with a lot of what the Corinthians have come to believe. It it resembles so much the Christian faith, but it's modified itself to fit the philosophies of the day. And can I be honest with you this morning? That kind of faith works most of the time. It it stands up. That hope is resolute enough to make it through most of what we experience in a lifetime, as long as everything is going fine around you. A metaphor is enough for most days. But there are moments when it is not enough. There are moments in life when positive thoughts and butterflies don't stand a chance against the darkness. Maybe some of you are living through that right now, where your world has been so dismantled, so taken apart, it's harder than ever to have genuine real hope. According to Paul, to believe in anything less than the resurrection of the corpses makes everything else about the Christian faith futile and pointless and sort of pitiful. Because what Paul is trying to describe for us here is the majesty and scope of what God has done on the cross. What he's done in that empty Easter tomb. This is all a great plot, Paul says, to take back every square inch of creation, even that which has died, especially that which has died. You see, it reveals the heart of God, this God who intends to redeem every molecule of what he has made, that that no, no speck of creation will be left behind in his grand plan. Because Christ is the firstborn of the resurrected, meaning that there will be more. That he is not just resurrected as a one-time event, but that he is the pioneer. He is the one who goes first, who shows and establishes and makes a way for all of us to follow suit. The risen body of Jesus is a sign of all that is to come. And that is ultimately the hope that cannot be defeated. The trust and belief that things will be different and better than what we can see right now, that nothing and no one is beyond God's redemption. Not long after Jim died, I went to visit with Sarah at the nursing home. And even in her old age, her mind was sharper than mine will ever be. And perhaps because she knew she was not long for this world, she rarely played around in pleasantries when we would have our conversations. She would jump right into the deep stuff pretty fast. She always wanted to talk about the resurrection, especially in those days following Jim's passing. And at first, I thought it was because she just liked to argue, which I think she did, that she just wanted to have a theological conversation, the likes of which were probably frowned upon at the nursing home dinner table. But it became clear to me after a few of these conversations that she wasn't just arguing. She was genuinely searching. This this brilliant mind of hers, this accomplished life, had one more mystery to unravel, and it wouldn't let her go. She had arrived at a place in her journey where her carefully crafted, very logical, well-researched answers were not as much help to her as they had been in the past. Her favorite sparring partner was one of our pastors here named Bobby Scales. Bobby and Sarah had become friends over the years, and I think she found Bobby's clear and straightforward faith fascinating, as do most of us who know and love Bobby. Inevitably, those conversations would come back to Jesus with her telling Bobby she was too smart to believe in the resurrection, and Bobby telling her she was too smart not to. And not long before she died, Bobby went to visit her one more time. They visited and they talked. Her speech was getting slower, even though her mind had not dulled a whit. She she seemed tired, so Bobby got up to leave, made his way out into the hall when the door to her room flew open wide again, and she asked him to come back, that she had something to tell him. 
With tears in her eyes, Sarah said, I wanted you to know that Jesus and I have been talking. And in typical Bobby Scales fashion, Bobby replied, well, what did he say? That visit ended differently than all the other visits had. Bobby had always prayed for her at the end of their conversations, but that day he prayed with her. Because what you believe matters. One of the lessons of these hard days we are making our way through, at least if we are ready to learn it, if we're ready to receive it, is that some of us have placed our hope in things that aren't worth our hope. That's a frightening feeling when you realize it. It can also be a gift, though, one that we might not have realized until much later in life otherwise. This morning, Paul wants to hand on to us what he received, the good news in which we stand, in which we are being saved, that Christ died for our sins, that he was dead and buried, that he was raised from the dead, and that one day, one day, we will be too. That there is no place we can go Nothing that can happen to us where we are beyond the redemptive reach of God's amazing grace. It's such a crazy thing to believe that we have to say it to each other every single week in worship. Not just because it's in the creed, but because it's the truth. And it's in the creed because the early Christians knew that the real stuff of faith, the stuff that matters most, is sometimes the hardest to believe. You don't write a creed to say that Jesus was a nice guy and we should be pleasant with each other. Nobody needs to be convinced of that. You write a creed to say that God has done something so inconceivable, so so profoundly gracious, that we need to be reminded of it every time we gather for worship because it's almost too good to be true. It's not just a sturdy hope. It's not just a strong hope. It is an eternal hope. It's why Paul can ask, where, O death, is now your sting? Where is your victory, boasting grave? It's why we can stand. Even this uncertain time. Because the faith was passed on to us. And we are called to pass it on to others in what we say, in what we teach, especially in how we live and in what we believe. This hope that even when we cannot see it, God is at work taking back every single thing he has made and making it right. Making it whole. What you believe matters. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
On this Mother's Day, I want to wish the happiest of Mother's Days to all our moms out there. A special blessing and a prayer for all of you who are missing your moms this Mother's Day. And special gratitude for all the women who become spiritual mothers to us. Because what you believe matters. As our hope is tested, let us place our hearts, our trust, our confidence in the fact that Christ is risen. And because he has been risen, one day we will be too. Because there is not a square inch of this creation that God is not taking back. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.